Welcome! This is going to be a video coming at you from the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory at Jefferson Patterson Parker Museum and our topic is going to be bagging and packing archaeological collections in their various bags and boxes. I'm Sarah Rivers Cofield. I am the curator of federal collections here and here at the Mac Lab we have about 9,000 boxes that look like this and that are bagged roughly like this. As always, as a disclaimer with these videos, if you are packing archaeological collections for a repository, check with that repository for their standards because we have our way of doing things, but other people have their requirements too. So, diving right in, if you are packaging an archaeological collection, hopefully you are familiar with the term provenience. Um, we package our items by provenience, which for archaeologists means which hole in the ground, which layer of soil, which shovel test pit. And we put a lot of importance on where artifacts are found because knowing what was found together and where it was found is what makes it important. But when you're storing collections, usually the material, the fragility, the weight dictates how you store things to prevent them from falling apart or hurting each other. So when you're in archaeology, you're putting all different kinds of things together by provenience. And so you have to be very mindful of how you're packaging your boxes to keep provenience intact while maximizing the preservation of the collection that's different materials and different weights. Really you want to make the preservation the first priority, the efficient use of space your second priority, and then organizationally speaking, keeping everything in order is great, but you can also use your labels to make sure that you're maximizing those other two first without losing things. So that's how we prioritize things in terms of our bagging and boxing. So first we're gonna talk about bagging and then we are going to dig into how we put the bags in the boxes. We bag artifacts by the catalog entry. So all artifacts that share characteristics can share one line on the catalog, three pipe stems with this measurement. Um, and those get bagged together. So each of our little bags has one artifact that goes on that catalog entry line. And what we often do is group those then by materials. So all three pipe bags might get grouped into one bag. Bags within bags within bags is how we keep track of all the different things and all of the provenience at the same time. Our rule of thumb is to use the smallest bag to fit the artifact. So if you have a big bone like this, it needs a bigger bag. Smaller artifacts use smaller bags, it's more efficient. But we do have some other rules of thumb that we go by for choosing bag size. One is that we don't go smaller than the two by three bag because super tiny bags are much more likely to get lost. So we at least do a two by three bag. Other things to keep in mind is that just because something sort of fits in the bag, it's not more efficient to force it. So as a perfect example, this guy looks like it's in the perfect size bag, but it won't shut. And you don't wanna put any force on it. You also have to make sure that the opening is wide enough that it doesn't scrape the bag on the way out. If you're scraping the artifact in any way, go up a bag size so that you don't do that. And don't do this. This is a classic. These do fit in this bag, but you really have to force that Ziploc. And it's not good because it crushes the artifacts and it makes the bag much more likely to fail sooner. Just go up a bag size and don't try to force it. You don't want your bag to be as thick as a muffin. You want it to lay fairly flat and be fairly relaxed. So we are going to do a demo now of how we pack one of our proveniences of artifacts. I have our lovely collections assistant for the Mac Lab here who's going to do the packing. She does this a lot in her day job. And so we're going to have her do the demonstrating while I do the talking and the narration. So when you think about how you pack archaeological artifacts, it's not unlike packing groceries, right? You don't put the bananas on the bottom of the bag and the potatoes on top. You choose the heaviest, least fragile things to put on the bottom of the bag. So what is our heaviest, least fragile thing here? 
Wrap your oyster shell. <laughs> the big oyster shell bag is going to go in the big bag first. So you may have noticed that there's also a big old bag of brick here. And what we've done with this particular lot is that the brick is so offensively heavy and not fragile compared to everything else that it's been put into a completely separate bag. So this whole lot, what we call a provenience, we call it lot, it's just simpler, um, has two bags labeled bag one of two and two of two. So if you take the heaviest, heaviest stuff, put it in its own bag, set it to the side. This is going to go in the box on its own. It's perfectly labeled. We know there's that extra bag, but for the bigger bag, the oyster shell went in first because it's the heaviest and it's on the bottom. Now, all the rest of the stuff, oftentimes um, you do make smaller bags, like one ceramics bag, one pipe bag, etc. For this particular collection, they took a different approach and took one other bag for the more lightweight let uh, more fragile things and they put them all in the same bag that's also perfectly fine because this bag is going to ride beautifully on top of that oyster shell without any of the little things sliding down so alice is going to show us how we pack that bag now so she's starting with the small overfired brick which still isn't super duper heavy it's not going to crush anything and now the big giant bone again heaviest and least fragile and then she's going to go from there Probably the most fragile thing here is the bag of charcoal and it's super light so that's going to end up on top. We put the glass in and the pipes and there's a couple of shells and a burn bone and those are going last because they're the most fragile things. Beautifully done. So now we close this bag and it's going to go in the bigger bag with the oyster shell but because it's in a nice big bag together, it's not gonna slide down. It's not gonna get crushed by that oyster shell. It's gonna ride on top with the heaviest stuff on the bottom and the lightest stuff on top and the labels all perfectly readable on the bag as you go. Well done, Alice. Thank you. <laughs> if it turns out that the heaviest thing is also the most fragile thing in your lot, as is often the case with corroded metals like iron, then those objects should probably be either put into some kind of special box so they can be on the bottom where they're heavy but they're also not being crushed or they should be pulled out into some other special kind of packaging here we have the oyster shells and the bricks and things like that in the regular lots but we pull all the metals out into desiccated microenvironments and there's another video about that that i would refer you to if you want to take that approach When it comes to choosing the size of your outer bag for each provenience that's going to go into the box, there's sort of two camps of collections managers who are equally devoted to organization. Um, there's the camp of people who want all the bags to be the same size, and it looks beautiful when you do it that way. Um, but oftentimes what happens when you do that is you end up with a way bigger bag for the smaller lots. Um, and we tend to think that that is a waste of plastic and it can also be a waste of space depending on which bag size you use. So we tend to be in the other camp where you choose the outer provenience bag by the size of the contents instead and you end up with different sizes of bags in the box and that's okay. We think that the different sizes of bags is a little bit more efficient in terms of how we pack our boxes. However, exceptions can and should be made if you have just one tiny little artifact in a lot. You shouldn't just put a two by three bag floating freely in a box of other bags. It's gonna get lost. You need to up the size for that kind of bag. We typically go for at least a six by six, or in this case, we have four by six bags, and we kind of group them together um, on the top of the box. So that's kind of the camp that we fall into. However, uh, there are many, many uh, collections that we get that are from phase one surveys or sites where you're only finding a little bit in each provenience, where it makes the most sense to instead of having a minimum bag size be like a four by six or six by six, 
go ahead and go smaller to a four by four, something that you can fit all the provenience on, and then group those bags into larger bags with lot number ranges on them so that you know what the contents are, and then you're filling up the box. So here we have a box from a collection where they wanted to use all six by six bags. And in order to maximize space, they went with layers. I'm gonna see if I can lift this out here. There's a layer of ethophone. There's one layer of artifacts. There's another whole layer in there so that they could actually use the space. We find that going with layers makes it harder to find things because you have to dig to get at the stuff in the bottom. So instead, this collection is being rehoused into bags that look like this, where you have a 10 by 12 or a bag that's about the same height as the box. And then she's taking the provenience bags, grouping them into the larger bags, writing the lot number range on them. Then when they go into the box, it's like a filing system and you can easily see what's in each bag. So that tends to be the camp that we fall into here. Now we're taking all of those bags that we've just packed and putting them in the box in a logical way that is both organized and also protective of the artifacts. And again, I have Alice who's going to demonstrate how we pack a box. So here we have, um, we've just unpacked a box, right? So usually you're starting with a big sea of artifacts and then you're choosing which boxes to do. So we're cheating a little bit because we already know how much is going to fit in here. Um, but the concept is still the same. So. She's going to, as a starting point, put the bags lined up in the box, standing up basically, um, in, in lot number order. And again, our lot number is our provenience. And so that is our starting point. However, as she does this, if you have a giant lot, as she has over there, compared to all of the other lots, then you can and should take that out of the order and put it in in a different, more logical way. So it's a little bit tetris -y here. Um, again, you're putting, you're standing these bags up because you've put them in with the heaviest stuff at the bottom, so they should be fairly well anchored. Um, it allows the artifacts to settle down into free spaces instead of being crushed. Um, and so she took all of the bigger size bags. Now she added three of the smaller ones and she put those in there. Um, and then she's going to, put this bag with the brick on the bottom on the side where it's not going to slide and crush the other things and then that one had a second bag of shell separated out that that goes behind that other bag so on one side of this box now we have most of the lots which are fairly small mixed artifacts with the heavy stuff on the bottom and on the other side is a much bigger lot that has bricks on the bottom shell behind and as you move this box and things shift only the, he the heavy things are gonna hit the other heavy things. And then, as we talked about this before, there was one bag in here at the very front that has a fragile wine bottle here and a bone, and it's super thin. And so one thing that we talk about with the boxes is all of these bags have vent holes in them, and it's tempting to squeeze all the air out of those bags and pack more on top if you're short on space. But it's not good for the artifacts to do um, you don't want to overfill the box. However, if you have a thin, fragile bag like this, you have a little bit of room on top, you have a pillow of air here, it's perfectly okay to pull something out of sequence and let it ride on top because that's actually going to be better for the artifacts. Even though it sort of hurts my heart a little bit that these lot numbers aren't in order because we all want to be organized, the box label tells you what's in there. So you're not hiding anything on anybody and it's better to preserve the artifacts. I happen to have in the collections that I carry a lot of boxes that have a lot of brick. Not because we kept too much brick, but because I am blessed with some amazing 17th century sites with brick architecture, and it is appropriate to keep a sample of brick for those sites. And inevitably, when I put everything in accession number order on the shelving, the boxes with the most brick end up on the very top shelf. And so one of the things I have learned is that if I have a brick sample bag, as I do here, and it's going to go in the box, of course I'm going to put it in its own separate bag so that I can stack the rest of the things on top of it without hurting anything. And I'm going to put it in the box first so that the heaviest, least fragile stuff is on the bottom. But then I also shift it all the way to the very front of the box. 
And the reasoning behind that, and then I can put all of the rest of the stuff in there. Let's put that right on the top. Have the rest of the box. It's all in there now. But the bricks are all the way on the bottom. They're all the way towards the front. When this ends up on the top shelf and you're lifting it down, those bricks are all going to be at the front already. So if they were at the back, they could slide forward and crush the rest of the things in the bags. Just because I have a lot of brick samples and they might be in the same lots, you don't want to put all those brick samples into one box. Um, be kind to your curators. Um, a rule of thumb is definitely no more than 40 pounds per box. These boxes are, have handholds, which is convenient, but they're not made for team lifting. So you want to make sure that they're manageable for one person. So that pretty much concludes our tips for bagging and packaging boxes. At the Mac Lab, we have another whole video on when to know when you have to replace all of those bags as you're checking through those boxes. So stay tuned for more tutorials on collections management issues at the Mac Lab.